Hello YouTube. Um, so today we're going to continue uh, looking at this problem of peer disagreement. Now in the previous video we saw uh, a few arguments in favour of conciliation. Uh, today we're going to turn to some problems for the view. Uh, first of all, a problem raised by Brian Weatherson in his article Disagreements, Philosophical and Otherwise, is the problem of stubborn interlocutors. Let's suppose that Frank and Vincent disagree on some proposition P. Uh, initially, Frank assigns a probability of 0 0.8 to P, and Vincent assigns a probability of 0 0.2. Frank accepts conciliation uh, and treats Vincent as an epistemic peer, so Frank uh, splits the difference and assigns 0 0.5. But let's suppose that Vincent does not accept conciliation, so he's unmoved by the fact that Frank assigned a different probability. Vincent remains steadfast and still assigns 0 0.2. Now notice that even though Frank has tried to be conciliatory, disagreement still remains, because Frank assigns a probability of 0 0.5, Vincent assigns a probability of 0 0.2. So Frank again has to split the difference, assigning 0 0.35. Vincent, of course, still assigns 0 0.2. So a disagreement still remains, Frank has to split the difference again, and so on, and eventually Frank is forced to go pretty much all the way to Vincent's position. Weatherson's worry, then, is that conciliation will only lead us to suspend judgment if everybody is conciliatory. If you come across anybody who's steadfast, you'll still disagree even after revising your belief, and that will force you to revise your belief again and again and again and again until you eventually end up sharing their opinion. So, uh, some responses to this problem. Well, first of all, uh, Adam Elger, in his article How to Disagree About How to Disagree, argues that we, we can stop splitting the difference after the first disagreement. Uh, the, the point, according to Elger, Elger is that the first disagreement provides you with additional evidence. It provides you with new evidence, uh, whereas the later disagreement, after you've revised your belief, does not. So let's say Frank considers all of the arguments and all of the evidence for P and he assigns a probability of 0 0.8. Well, then he encounters his epistemic peer, Vincent, who assigns 0 0.2. Now, the fact that Vincent makes this judgment is new information for Frank. It's new evidence uh, about about the proposition P, and that should lead him to revise his belief. But once Frank has revised his belief, well, the fact that Vincent still assigns 0 0.2 is, is not new evidence anymore. There's no new evidence there, so uh, he doesn't need to revise his belief again. Frank doesn't need to revise his belief again. Now, I'm not sure this response is entirely persuasive. Uh, it seems to me that the fact that Vincent assigns 0 0.2 after Frank has revised his belief actually is new evidence because Vincent might have done something else, right? Vincent might have acted differently in response to the disagreement. He might have revised the probability of P up or down. So the fact that he sticks with his original probability, I mean, at least prima facie, that looks like it actually is new evidence. Um, maybe not, but I, uh, you know, that, that seems like a bit of a problem with this response. I think maybe a more uh, maybe a better objection to Weatherson's argument is that he assumes that conciliation involves splitting the difference uh, in in kind of a, a sort of literal sense where you know we 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 we, we assign different probabilities to p conciliation requires us to settle on a probability exactly in between but perhaps we should simply assign an unknown probability to p or at least uh, an unknown probability within the two extremes. Uh, we, we might say that the probability is somewhere between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, but we can't say where. Well, in, in, in that case, obviously, uh, this stubborn interlocutor's argument doesn't, doesn't work. And actually, I think assigning an unknown probability is more in line with this idea of suspending judgment. Um, because, you know, suppose that I assign a probability of 0 0.45 and you, you assign a probability of 0 0.95, uh, splitting the difference, we would get 0 0.7. But a pro assigning a probability of 0 0.7 isn't a suspension of judgment. We'd be saying it's more likely than not that P is true. So um, so, so maybe we, sh we should be clear that then that conciliation isn't exactly about splitting the difference. It, it really is just suspending judgment and saying, well, 
we just don't know what the probability of p is. Um, okay, uh, one of the primary arguments against conciliation, this has also been urged by Brian Weatherson, is that it's self-refuting. The argument is quite simple. Conciliation says that we should suspend judgment when faced with peer disagreement, but conciliation itself faces peer disagreement. In other words, there are plenty of very talented philosophers who disagree that we should suspend judgment in the face of peer disagreement. So, by conciliation's own lights, we should not accept conciliation. It's self-refuting. How might the defender of conciliation respond? Well, one option is to take the view that conciliation is not a proposition in which we believe, but it's instead a, a kind of guiding methodology. We can conduct our lives and uh, our attitudes in accordance with the principle without believing that the principle is true. Uh, and notice uh, th th this, is, this is not uncommon, right? This is just uh, what every moral anti-realist does. Moral anti-realists uh, do not treat any moral statements as true. So the, the statement stealing is wrong, according to a moral anti-realist, is not true. It's, it's not a fact that stealing is wrong. It's not a fact that you shouldn't steal. Nevertheless, you can conduct your life in accordance with principles like stealing is wrong. The vast majority of moral anti-realists have that attitude. Um, we're perfectly happy to make moral claims and conduct our lives in accordance with moral principles. We just, we just don't hold that such principles uh, express facts um, or you know, describe facts in, in, in the world. Uh, so you can have the same attitude to conciliation. Conciliation is a principle guiding one's intellectual inquiry. It's not itself true or false. So it's not self-undermining. Indeed, notice that if we are anti-realist about normative claims, then we will already treat conciliation this way, because conciliation and steadfastness tell, tell us how we should respond to peer disagreement. Conciliation tells us that we should suspend judgment in, the, in response to peer disagreement. Steadfastness says we shouldn't. These are normative claims. They're rather like saying you should give to charity or you shouldn't steal. Um, so uh, maybe this would uh, be one way out for the conciliationist. Of course, this kind of response will probably only work if you accept normative anti-realism, which is controversial. So uh, a second response is that we should, uh, we, we can apply conciliation to everything except conciliation itself. We can, we can be cons conciliatory about everything but disagreement. Uh, again, Adam Elgar, um, in the article How to Disagree About How to Disagree, uh, defends this view. He calls it partial conciliation. So partial conciliation is the view that peer disagreement should lead you to suspend judgment except with respect to the proposition peer disagreement should lead you to suspend judgment. You should be conciliatory with respect to everything except conciliation itself. Now, the main worry about this kind of view is that it looks just arbitrary and ad hoc. You know, what, why, what grounds are there for treating conciliation itself differently from everything else? Um, you know, I mean, why shouldn't I say, for instance, well, peer disagreement should lead us to suspend judgment except with respect to the moral realism debate or except with respect to debates about God uh, or except with respect to colour reductionism or you know, what, what, whatever else. I mean, it, it seems that we're just building into the statement of conciliation whatever we want to remain steadfast about. And, and that's that's obviously arbitrary. Now, Adam Elgar has quite an interesting response to this. He says, actually, this manoeuvre isn't arbitrary. Instead, it's an instance of a, a more fundamental uh, rule or constraint, which he uh, states as follows. He says, it is in the nature of giving consistent advice that one's advice be dogmatic with respect to its own correctness. Uh, so Elgar draws an analogy to consumer magazines. Uh, imagine the magazine Consumer Reports. Um, I, I don't know if this is a real magazine. Uh, but suppose that Consumer Reports rates appliances and it advises you which uh, appliance would be the best to buy. Suppose also that it rates other consumer magazines. Well, then it would be incoherent to recommend a different magazine over itself. Um, so we can imagine that uh, Consumer Reports says to buy Toaster X and the alternative magazine Smart Shopper says 
You know, don't buy X, X is rubbish, buy toaster Y. Now let's suppose that Consumer Reports were to say of itself that Consumer Reports is worthless and that Smart Shopper is the best consumer magazine, only follow their advice. Well then, Consumer Reports says to buy Toaster X, but it also says to follow the advice of Smart Shopper, which says to buy Toaster Y, not Toaster X. That advice is simply incoherent. Consumer Reports would be telling us to buy Toaster X, but also not to buy Toaster X. It, it, it would just be uh, outright contradictory. The moral of the story uh, for Alga is that any piece of advice you give must assume its own correctness. If Consumer Reports rates consumer magazines, they must always rate themselves number one. And this would not be a product of uh, bias, it would not be arbitrarily preferring themselves over others. Uh, Elga says, I quote, To put forward recommendations about toasters and cars is to put them forward as good recommendations, and Consumer Reports cannot consistently do that, while also claiming that contrary recommendations are superior. So always rating themselves number one does not result from an arbitrary or ad hoc exception to their standards. They are forced to rate themselves number one in order to be consistent with their other ratings. And the same is true uh, for methods of evaluating beliefs. Any method for evaluating belief must assume that no alternative method is better. So it's not ad hoc to say that conciliation should not apply to itself. Uh, this follows from a general constraint that, that any advice, uh, policy or method or whatever, must follow. Right? Any advice must assume its own correctness. Um, so conciliation has good independent reason to treat uh, disagreement about disagreement differently from disagreement about other topics. So those are, are, are two ways out for the conciliationist and I think that uh, they sound pretty plausible to me. I'm, I'm not sure conciliation is outright self-refuting, but I think there is another problem here. Um, even if conciliation isn't self-refuting, it may well be self-undermining in a weaker way. Notice that we have to reason our way to conciliation. Conciliation is a substantial epistemological rule. Um, many objections have been raised against it. So before adopting it, a good, open-minded epistemologist will will work through the evidence and work through the arguments. And she will consider the reasons in favour of conciliation and the reasons against conciliation. So let's suppose that uh, the arguments lead her to accept conciliation. Well, the problem is that having adopted conciliation, if she then encounters peer disagreement about any aspect of any of these arguments, and she certainly will encounter peer disagreement about that, well, she's going to have to drop her credence in them. She's going to have to suspend judgment about the very arguments that led her to become conciliatory. So from the point of view of conciliation, there are no persuasive arguments for conciliation because every argument for conciliation uh, faces peer disagreement. Uh, in terms of its force, right? Anybody who, any epistemologist who rejects conciliation will say that the arguments for conciliation don't work. And so if you're conciliatory, you have to suspend your judgment about the force of those arguments. So for the conciliationist, as I say, there are no persuasive arguments for conciliation, and that's an uncomfortable, um, that's an uncomfortable position, right? So, so conciliation may not be directly self-refuting, but it, it undermines uh, the very arguments that support it. We're in this sort of rather strange position that having reasoned our way to this view, we then have to admit that our reasoning wasn't actually good enough to justify the view. Um, and so I hope you can see that that's, as I say, it's an uncomfortable position. It's not, it's not a direct self-refutation, but um, it's, it's also, it's not clear that we can say that anyone should adopt conciliation on rational grounds. Because by conciliation's own, own lights, there actually are no persuasive arguments for it. Conciliation also faces the problem of double counting evidence. Uh, to use um, an example again from Brian Weatherson, consider a detective, Frank, investigating a murder. He wonders whether uh, Vincent is guilty. Witnesses 
uh, attest that Vincent was seen near the building the crime took place. Call this evidence E1. However, Frank also knows, perhaps due to other witnesses or due to video evidence, that Vincent was actually in this building at the time. Call this evidence E2. Now it's clear that E1 is evidence for Vincent's guilt. But given the further evidence E2, E1 is irrelevant. If we know that Vincent was actually in the building on the day of the crime, then learning that he was near the building on the day of the crime doesn't help the investigation. In technical terms, we say that E2 screens off E1. If you have E2, you don't need E1 anymore. E1 plus E2 provides no better evidence than E2 alone. And it would obviously be a mistake to say that E1 and E2 give us two separate pieces of evidence for Vincent's guilt. There's actually only one piece of evidence here, um, and that's just, just E2. So the worry is that conciliation is going to involve uh, making the same kind of mistake as assuming that both E1 and E2 are separate pieces of evidence. Uh, the thought is that we trust other people because we take them to make reliable judgments. Uh, the fact that a reliable individual responds to evidence in a certain way is itself evidence. So if the weatherman believes that it will rain tomorrow on the basis of some evidence E, the fact that he's made this judgment is itself evidence that it's reasonable to believe it will rain on the basis of E. But if I also know E and I know how to evaluate E, well, this knowledge arguably screens off the weatherman's judgments. I trust the judgments of other people in those cases where I don't have access to the evidence or where I'm unable to evaluate the evidence for whatever reason. That's why I listen to the weatherman. If I had all, all access to all the meteorological data and I knew how to evaluate the data, I wouldn't need to listen to the weatherman. I use the weatherman as a proxy for evidence that I don't know or can't evaluate. So to assume that the weatherman's judgments count as further evidence is, base, is essentially to count the same evidence twice. It's, it's like saying that, you know, that the fact that Vincent was, was near the building on the day of the crime gives us additional evidence uh, in, ad, in, you know, in addition to the fact that he was in the building in the, in the day of the crime. You know, but once you know he's in the building, right, it doesn't matter that he was near the building. So the same thought is, well, you know, if, if we're talking about whether it will rain tomorrow, if I know all the evidence um, concerning the meteorological data and I know how to evaluate that, then the, the judgments of the, the weathermen are, are irrelevant. Um, so, so arguably then conciliation is going to force us to, uh, to, to double count evidence. And that may be a bit of a problem. Okay, uh, another objection. So far, we have stated conciliation in terms of actual peer disagreement. But we might ask whether conciliation depends on actual or possible peers. Should actual peer disagreement lead us to suspend judgment? Or should the mere possibility of peer disagreement lead us to suspend judgment? Uh, Thomas Kelly has argued that conciliation should be defined in terms of possible peers. The actual existence of peers is contingent and fragile. Kelly uses the example of Newcomb's problem. Uh, the details of this problem don't matter, but I recommend looking it up online anyway because it's a, a really cool problem. Uh, for our purposes, all you need to know is that the problem involves two boxes, uh, and you're asked whether to open only one box or whether to open both boxes. Some people think you should open only one box, and some people think you should open both boxes. Now, Kelly asks us to imagine two worlds, just like our world. In world X, opinion is evenly divided between uh, one boxes and two boxes. In world Y, everybody is a one boxer. Now, this isn't because some you know, evil tyrant has killed all of the two boxers, or because somebody has come up with some ingenious argument that decisively shows one boxing to be correct. The people in World Y have access to the same arguments that we have, it's just that, by chance, they all happen to be one boxers. They, they're just all convinced by the same kinds of arguments that convince uh, one boxers in our world. Now, consider a student in each world learning 
about Newcomb's problem. She carefully considers all of the arguments for each position. She also learns about the views of other people. Now, the question is, should the student in World Y be more confident of one boxing than the student of World X? Remember, where in World Y, everyone's a one boxer, in World X, opinion is evenly divided. Well, the problem with taking this kind of view is that surely all the student of World Y has to do is imagine World X and she will see that there could be epistemic peers who favour two boxing. She will see that uh, a rational, well-informed person can doubt that one boxing is right. So it's difficult to see how epistemic peers being actualised, rather than being merely possible, could make a difference. And Kelly concludes that conciliation should be framed in terms of merely possible peer disagreement and not actual peer disagreement. Because for any view that you hold, even if everyone agrees with you, you can always imagine, it's, it's always possible, that uh, a, a rational, well-informed, etc. person would disagree. And surely that should, be, that should be enough. Why does it matter whether that person is actual? Now, okay, so let's say that conciliation should be framed in terms of possible peer disagreement. Why is this a problem? Well, the trouble is, is that if conciliation is given in terms of possible peer disagreement, it seems to lead to a, a, a total global scepticism of, of everything. Uh, because absolutely no beliefs uh, whatsoever um, are, are free from possible peer disagreement. It's always possible that an epistemic peer will disagree with, with any belief you hold. Even basic beliefs about the external world or about logic or about your own mind. I mean, in, in the actual world, there have been very few uh, radical sceptics. So there have been very few people who have doubted the existence of things like trees and mountains and cars and tables. Uh, in fact, I don't think, um, well, I don't know, actually, maybe I, I have encountered some, some of them, but uh, it's, 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 it's quite rare, right? You don't usually encounter people who say that there's just no reason to think that you know, trees and cars and so on exist. Um, but there are plenty of arguments for radical scepticism, arguments that have a lot of intuitive force, and we can certainly imagine a possible world in which literally all your epistemic peers find those arguments convincing. For any proposition you like, you can imagine a possible world where your epistemic peers believe it. So it seems like conciliation is going to force us to suspend judgment just across the board. And um, I mean, that's not something that most epistemologists would be comfortable with. Uh, now, David Christensen uh, argues in response that actually uh, only actual disagreement matters. Uh, conciliation should be framed in terms of actual disagreement, not merely possible disagreement. So we saw in the first video the case of, of the restaurant where I calculate the bill to be £27 each and you calculate it to be £28 each. Uh, we saw that in this case it would be rational to suspend judgment. But Christensen says that if Kelly's argument is right, it looks like we should remain steadfast even here. After all, if there's no difference between actual and possible peers, well, you know, it's, it's always possible for a peer to arrive at a different number. Uh, and in fact, we can push this kind of case further. Suppose you're in a restaurant, I calculate the bill at £27 each, and uh, 18 brilliant arith arithmetic wizards who I'm eating dinner with calculate it to be £28 each. Well, surely there's no question that at the very least I should suspend judgment. Um, I mean, probably I, I would just go with what the uh, the 18 arithmetic wiz wizards say, but suspending judgment is, is the minimally rational thing to do here. Uh, but again, uh, if there's no difference between actual and possible peers, it seems like I should remain steadfast. There is a possible world where the 18 brilliant mathematicians are wrong and where I'm right. Um, so, so Christensen thinks that, uh, that, that we just shouldn't accept uh, defining conciliation in terms of possible peer disagreement. Uh, Christensen suggests that the fact that disagreement is always possible is really just a restatement of... Uh, what we already know, which is that we're all fallible thinkers, we all make mistakes. But it's precisely the fact that we all make mistakes, it's precisely the fact that we're all fallible, that should lead us to suspend judgment in cases of actual peer disagreement. Actual peer disagreement is important because it provides evidence that the possibility of error 
has been actualized. It provides evidence that the possibility that you've made an error is in fact the case. So returning to the example of Newcomb's problem, the, what Christensen would say is that the world X one boxer has more evidence that she's made an error than the world Y one boxer. So it would indeed be rational for the uh, world X one boxer to give less credence to her belief. So uh, that's Christensen's uh, response to this problem. And if we accept that conciliation should be defined in terms of actual peer disagreement, then arguably scepticism isn't really so much of a, a threat because there are great areas of common sense, science, mathematics, history, and so on, where there isn't significant peer disagreement. I mean, maybe a few peers disagree, but in many fields, there is substantial consensus on a number of topics. Pretty much no biologist doubts that one of the primary processes of evolution is Darwinian natural selection. Um, you're unlikely to encounter a physicist who thinks that general relativity is completely mistaken. Um, no historian doubts that the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice. Uh, there might be disagreement about why they did it, but the fact that they did it, I think, is, is pretty well established. Unfortunately, this isn't the case for fields like religion, ethics, philosophy, uh, and we might just say that the epistemic conditions in these fields uh, are not so good. Uh, philosophers should, should not hold their beliefs so strongly. Maybe they should even suspend judgment. Um, but, but global scepticism, according to Christensen, is, is not uh, a threat. A final question for the conciliationist is, how frequent is peer disagreement? Uh, in, in the real world, no two people have access to the same evidence. No two people have thought about a topic for equivalent periods of time, with equivalent powers of reasoning. In particular, even if you are generally intelligent, that doesn't necessarily apply across the board. On some topics, you might be pretty stupid. Um, and so one way we can undermine the force of conciliation is, is to insist that peer disagreement is actually quite rare. So, I mean, much of the discussion that we've had so far has been quite abstract. But if we think about real cases of disagreement, one of the things we find is that disagreement on one topic, say moral realism, usually ends up uh, entailing disagreement about numerous other topics. Uh, so certainly I've, I've found that when I argue with people, you know, sometimes it, it might even start out as, as a, a relatively minor point. Um, but as you go through the discussion, it turns out you just disagree on all sorts of different things. Um, you know, the discussion kind of branches out and it's just d disagreement after disagreement. And you end up thinking like, Jesus, this guy's just wrong about everything you know even even down to the, uh, the the sort of basic philosophical methodology um at least in the case of philosophical disagreements in in science similarly there are you know, disagreements about scientific methodology um in his history people disagree about historic proper methodology for history um and and seemingly minor disagreements often end up arising actually as a result of a, a whole host of other disagreements so the point is if we disagree about numerous topics, I can't consider you to be an epistemic peer because from my point of view, you're wrong about so many things. You're not reliable. By definition, an epistemic peer is somebody who tends to come to accurate beliefs. So if I think that you hold numerous incorrect beliefs, then you're not my peer. Um, and you know, from, from my point of view, as I say, you're, you're wrong about everything. So, I mean, what one response to this is to say, well, look, even if you aren't peers, in any particular case, often you don't know whether you're in the epistemically inferior or superior position. So, again, you should suspend judgment. In the case of, of say, when you're arguing with somebody and, and it turns out you disagree on a whole host of things, again, you just don't know whether, whether you're in the better position or they're in the better position. But, I mean, that kind of response seems quite question-begging um, because... As I said, from my point of view, it seems to me that you're the one who's wrong about almost everything. So, I mean, there's no question for me that I'm in the epistemically superior position. Uh, perhaps a better response is that even if you do know that somebody is in an epistemically inferior position, that doesn't necessarily mean you can discount their view. Suppose we're two biologists studying the link between red meat consumption and cancer. 
And let's say I do a very large study that shows no correlation with cancer. You do a smaller study that does reveal a correlation. Uh, let's assume that both studies have equally good methodologies. In this case, I have better evidence than you, just in virtue of my larger sample size. But arguably, your study still provides good reason to be sceptical, good reason to think that maybe there is a correlation, a connection to cancer. My evidence, even though it's better than yours, is not enough to justify maintaining my view that there is no correlation. So I, I should at least be, be more sceptical. And so maybe we could say, uh, actually, even, even when somebody is epistemically inferior to us, uh, that still provides uh, a reason for scepticism. Maybe not all the way to suspending your judgment, but certainly um, provides a reason for reducing your confidence in your belief. Maybe that's one thing the conciliationists could say. A final question that uh, I want to raise before we end is whether there might be ethical reasons to favour conciliation or steadfastness. At one point that we might make in favour of conciliation is that it does seem to motivate a uh, kind of humility, um, a sort of general sceptical attitude, uh, and perhaps more acceptance of other people. Debates can become quite heated. People can sometimes become angry, especially if, if you think about political and moral debates. And we might say that conciliation encourages uh, open-mindedness and it prevents people from becoming dogmatic or stubborn or fundamentalist in their attitudes. I'm sure you've met people who are too dogmatic about their beliefs uh, and perhaps intellectual inquiry would proceed more smoothly if we adopted this conciliatory view. On the other hand, uh, we might argue that conciliation is, um, is weak or spineless. You know, cha changing your beliefs just because you've encountered disagreement, that seems to evince um, a lack of, of intellectual courage, I guess we, we might say. Uh, and I do think, I mean, for me, there is something admirable about people who remain committed to unpopular ideas and who don't let disagreement shake them. Um, and I mean, more, maybe more seriously, uh, notice that many of our beliefs and values are quite central to our identities. Uh, think about somebody who is um, you know, an atheist in a very religious area. Uh, some areas like of, of the United States are very heavily religious. Uh, being an atheist in that area becomes quite a central part of your identity, part of your life. And we might worry that conciliation requires us to change who we are, to change our central commitments merely because of what other people believe. And in that respect, it seems like um, a kind of just conformism, you know, in a very negative sense. Uh, so, I don't know, that may be something to, to think about, whether there are ethical arguments on either side. Um, but that's all I'm going to talk about. So uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.